Welcome to the Software Engineering Productivity Group webinar on HTML5. This is one of the periodic shows that SCP puts on, allowing group members to share their knowledge and help each other. If you haven't already joined the Software Engineering Productivity Group on LinkedIn, go ahead and do so. We're the top software engineering group on LinkedIn with a, uh, with a great membership of very experienced professionals. And I'm always amazed at the depth and quality of the discussions our group members have about software engineering and, and many other things. It's, it's just extraordinary, the, the quality of the people we have and, and the topics that we have going. And before we start the webinar, I would like to thank Zorient, who's the sponsor for SCP for making this possible, and Olivier Tofan, the VP for Social Media and Software Engineering, uh, of Software Engineering Productivity at Zorient, would like to share a few words. Welcome, Olivier. Thank you, Michael. I represent the social media division of Xorient. This division grows and manages more than 100 groups and subgroups on LinkedIn. We also uh, develop advanced social media technologies, both web-based and mobile. Xorient is the official sponsor of Software Engineering Productivity, already the largest group on LinkedIn for software engineering executives. We do so to stay up to date with new trends and best practices and continue to be a leader in software engineering, including HTML5. Being true believers in the scalability and performance of HTML5, we are particularly happy to sponsor this webinar. We are also proud to present Brian Albers and Kazi, the leader in fast, scalable, and flexible full duplex real-time web communications. I'm looking forward to hearing Brian's presentation the floor is yours, Michael. Thanks, Olivier. So today we're privileged to have Brian Albers talk with us about HTML5. He's going to describe what it is, what the implications are for web development, and how to use it. And Brian is the VP of Research and Development for Kazing, which specializes in HTML web sockets. Brian has spoken at Java 1, the Web 2.0 Expo, and many other conferences, and he's a co-author of the Pro HTML programming a book with power, uh, on powerful APIs for richer internet application development published by A-Press in 2010. He has over 14 years of experience in product development for very large enterprises with success in bringing in projects to production from the very early stages of research and prototyping and all the way through completion. And he was the, also a senior development manager at Oracle. Uh, amongst many other things, which I could go on and on, Brian. And we welcome our listeners and, and audience to send in questions with the chat tool uh, throughout the presentation. And I will ask Brian as many of the questions as time permits. And any questions that we aren't able to get to in the show, we'll, we will be answering in a post accompanying the webinar uh, when we publish it. Hey, thanks for joining us, Brian. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Olivier, for that wonderful introduction. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Brian Albers. I'm the VP of R&D at Kazing. And Kazing itself is, as I said, an HTML5 WebSocket company, which produces uh, the Kazing Gateway. And we've been working in HTML5 for about the last three years. And um, when we started the company, we were working on building uh, what we would call a better Comet server, for those who are familiar with the term Comet in the industry. And then when WebSockets uh, arrived on the scene, we created a product, being the gateway, around that WebSocket specification. And we kept it up to date and improved on it as the specification itself evolved. Now, um, a few years ago, members of the company decided that we would uh, focus our work on a book as well and uh, kicked that project off last year and uh, released last month the uh, results of that, which is Pro HTML5 Programming, uh, which was originally dedicated to covering WebSockets, but it has since expanded to cover all of the topics of HTML5. So for the agenda today, so we'll start off covering just a little bit of the history and the ideas behind HTML5, and why was the standard started, what are the goals, uh, then we'll dive into a very high level look at some of the new features that were introduced in HTML5, um, some of them just being simplifications to existing web page markup that we already know today, and others being brand new types of functionality and communication. Then we'll uh, list a little bit of uh, tips and tricks to developing HTML5 using the current tool set. And finally, we'll move on and point out the future directions in web development. 
Now I know I have a large audience here of different types of uh, experience and skills. I'll try to strike a bit of a balance between giving you sort of an overview of the capabilities of HTML5 without bogging you down with too much code. Uh, nonetheless, I understand this is a forum for software engineers, so I won't shy from uh, the tech, shy away from the tech entirely. And if you have detailed questions, feel free to ask them. So let's start off with the hype. Um, there's been a lot of hype out there about HTML5. Um, listed here are some verbatim quotes that we've seen in the industry over the last few months. Now, behind the hype, there's of course the specification, and um, even though the specification itself is not completely done, and even though browsers are picking up features, there are still many gotchas and bugs working against HTML5, um, some of it just being unimplemented at this point, and some of it in the ways that the browsers are actually implementing the specification. Um, but what I want to point out here in these quotes is that this is something you won't see very often. There are three companies listed here, namely Apple, Google, and Microsoft. We don't necessarily get along so well, but what we found over the last few months is that one thing that they can really all agree on is that HTML5 is vital to the future of software engineering and web communication. And because of that, there's a great deal of momentum behind the specification. So just for a little bit, I'll talk about the timeline of HTML itself and what that meant for the development of the newest iteration in HTML5. So HTML, as we all know, has been around for a good you know, 15 years or so. And what I want to focus on here is the fact that in 2001, there was the publication of the last major version of HTML, which was HTML4. And uh, since then, the effort to develop HTML largely stagnated in the first half of the last decade. And most of the effort in standardization was focused on a technology called XHTML. But in 2004, a group of engineers that were largely made up of uh, employees at browser development companies or organizations, they started a group called the What Working Group uh, to improve specifically web application development. Their original spec was called the Web Applications 1.0 spec, and later that was renamed as HTML5. And at that point, there were some competing efforts around the future of the web, some of them coming from the W3, some of them coming from the What Working Group. But with a lot of momentum behind the What Working Group, eventually the two organizations merged together and decided to move forward with a single specification. Um, at that point, some browsers were already starting to ship some of the earliest implementations of HTML5 features, such as the Canvas component. So in uh, 2008, the What Working Group and HTML5 joined up uh, as a joint effort, and they published a first unified effort at a draft, which we now know as HTML5. And the one other date I wanted to point out, because this one actually gets talked about quite a bit in the media, is uh, the 2022 date, which is known as the proposed recommendation date. Now, there's been some uh, news about how this seems alarming, that it takes so long for HTML5 to complete. But what I want to point out is that what this milestone really means is that the designers want there to be two independent and yet fully interoperable, completely compatible implementations of HTML5 by that date. And while that might still seem to be a long time for such a goal, when you consider that that goal has still not been met for HTML4, or even for Flash, or Silverlight, or many other successful client technologies, that date makes a lot more sense in context. It, it doesn't mean that HTML5 or any of those other technologies um, don't have a legitimate place in today's development. Um, consequently, if anyone had ignored HTML4 back in 2001 until it had a uh, at two competing versions and implementations of the same spec, they would uh, have been way behind the curve in software development. The more important date I'd like you to focus on is 2012, and that's uh, here on the left side of the chart. And that's the date where the final documentation of the specification becomes complete, and at that point, no new API changes are possible. It's not decided yet what will happen to the spec beyond that date, um, or what will, what will be done with features which uh, happen after 2012, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Hey, Brian, we do have one question sure. from a listener about when we, when you would expect that there, that most or all of the features in HTML5 would be implemented and available on platforms? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll spend a little more time talking about that near the end of the presentation, but what I do want to say is that um, at this point about 50% of the browsers out there, namely the uh, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, and Opera, are supporting most of the features I'll be talking about today. And Internet Explorer 9, which is just in beta right now and is expected to be released in the next year, will actually also support a large majority of those features. And I'll give you a tip at the end that lets you know if there's a particular feature you're targeting, or you can go to find out if it's widely available. 
Thanks. Okay. So there, are, as I mentioned before, there are a few organizations working on HTML5 together, um, three of them specifically that are working on this effort. The first one, as I mentioned, is the What Working Group. It's a small group of individuals working for browser vendors. Um, however, the W3C is the official standards body developing HTML, and always has been, and it hosts the ultimate version of the specification. So there are participants in the process, such as Microsoft, who only work with the W3C, and that, therefore it's important that the W3C and the What Working Group maintain a very solid working relationship so that a unified spec emerges. Also, because HTML5 includes not just programming interfaces, but a few network protocols, such as WebSocket, which is something I'll talk about later, uh, and clarifications on HTTP itself, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, has taken ownership of those areas of the specification uh, because the IETF is the standards body commonly associated with network protocol standardization. The specifications themselves uh, live at the locations I list here. These are the current locations. Uh, although most followers who are keeping a close eye on HTML5 are largely following the W3C version of the spec as the source of truth today. Okay, now if you do go and look at the spec documents that I just showed you, and, and they'll be available later for your perusal as well, you might wonder where some of the technologies that I talk about today are listed. So where's the storage API or WebSockets or geolocation? And the answer to that question is that some of these features, which are largely programmatic in nature, they've been broken out of the HTML5 spec itself and put into their own documents so that the HTML5 spec can remain focused on markup elements. Uh, and the discussion on these JavaScript-oriented functionality uh, features is in the separate documentation and separate uh, discussion areas. However, if you ask anyone participating in the process, all of these features and specifications are together considered to be HTML5 in terms of the marketing term, um, and they will clearly state that. So it's best to think of HTML as a, a set of complementary technologies, including both the markup side and the JavaScript APIs, which are used with that markup. So at this point, we'll take a look at some of the design principles which drove the creation of the standard. And most of these principles were set in place at the very beginning of the design process. The first principle I want to focus on is compatibility. And this was a very big goal of the folks who were designing HTML5. Although many in the media would have you believe that HTML5 is a sort of a revolutionary technology, it's in fact uh, designed to be compatible with the HTML that most people know and develop with today. And um, this is actually in contrast with the, with the XHTML project, which would have relied on more strict but incompatible markup with what we're seeing today. Now, all old websites in an HTML5 world should just continue to work. And instead, the focus here is on making the things that developers are already trying to do, make those things easier. And, and that's what the designers meant uh, by the phrase that we sometimes hear, paving the cow paths. Um, what that's about, it's about trying to standardize the same techniques that web authors have already been using for the last 10, 15 years. So if 75% of the authors are creating header or footers in their pages, why not standardize that and make it easier to achieve with actual HTML elements? Or, for example, how many of us have to write complicated JavaScript date pickers for our applications? Um, I know I've done that, and trying to get those to work across different locales and different browsers was a major pain for my development team and some of my past positions. And that's a good example of the kind of things that the HTML uh, spec is trying to solve. A second of the four principles is uh, to clarify that the end user is the focus of the specification. So the utility here is designed for the end user first, then the authors of pages, then implementers, then specification writers, and then theoretical purity as a, as a nice to have but, but last priority design. Uh, similarly, the features of HTML5, they are designed to be secure by default in the common use case scenario. So when a web application developer uses these features, the path of least resistance should lead to a secure result. And I know we've all either been experienced uh, to, uh, we've experienced or been forced to work around browser security holes in the last 15 years. So the new HTML5 spec tries to avoid that wherever possible. And, and likewise, older elements, um, things like, uh, that were very CSS-like, elements like bold tags and center tags, these have been removed from the spec to prevent confusion between HTML and the cascading style sheet standard, which is used to style those web pages. The third of the four principles is interoperability. And 
it's worth pointing out here that one of the main problems of the previous versions of HTML was under specification. The entire uh, web development community has really suffered from this for the last decade because browser implementers were really making best guesses about what the original HTML spec writers intended. And this led to a massive number of differences in how pages had to be written in order to be considered cross-browser. And I, I can say personally, when I worked at my former company, we had an entire project which was devoted to generating style sheets which were specific to whichever particular browser uh, version was accessing a given page. And that's a real waste of resources that never should have been necessary. So this time around, the HTML5 spec, uh, very detailed. It's nearly 1,000 pages. Um, but before you get scared, I mean, that's 1,000 pages of specification for browser implementers, not what developers need to know. And along the same lines, the designers wanted to remove unnecessary complexity so that page authors wouldn't get confused about the right way to get something done. And um, this makes browser developers and app developers' lives easier. So let's look at a couple of very specific examples of that. The first one I want to point out here for anyone who's written an HTML page in the last two decades um, is uh, the doc type element. Uh, this is something most people would be familiar with, and, but they're often puzzled by what the, the elements of a doc type mean. And it was supposed to indicate, you know, if this particular page was in strict compliance or not strict compliance, uses certain features, etc. So HTML5 got rid of all that. And now there's just a single doc type. It's doc type HTML. And it works in all cases just to specify this is an HTML document. This is very indicative of the kind of changes HTML5 was trying to make. Similarly, with uh, character sets, there was sort of complicated mechanism to, de to describe what character set was being used on a particular page. Now it's simply care set UTF-8, for example, and you're done. Okay, so another key design principle is that HTML5 applications should be accessible, and that means accessible to all languages, accessible to all users, regardless of disability, etc. And um, what this allows is for developers to apply additional roles to their pages, uh, and these are specified by the Web Accessibility Initiative. And those roles let you optimize your pages for screen readers, for low vision users. But interesting to point out that the base elements of HTML5 um, are designed to make these pages be accessible by default where possible. And that way developers don't have to opt in to make pages accessible and there's less chance of failure there. So although accessibility in HTML5 is still a work in progress, it is being designed as upfront as a usability uh, design principle. And there are some things that they can do in the spec that allow people to avoid accessibility minefields that have been present in web development for the last uh, 15 years or so. Now, a side goal of HTML5 is, at its core, just to reduce the need for plugins. Much of the functionality that requires plugins in today's web pages has equivalents in HTML5 as native browser functionality. Besides the fact that most of the popular plugins are proprietary to specific vendors, they also can cause problems in day-to-day -day development. Um, even popular plugins aren't always available in every environment. They might be older versions that are required. And they also give additional attack vectors for security, which is something we've seen a lot of uh, problems with recently. So plugins, they can cause difficulty uh, with content around them. And one of the things that HTML5 developers wanted to do was reduce the need for plugins. But that being said, I often get asked um, if HTML5 means the end of plugins like Flash or Silverlight. And I just want to say that clearly they are not going away, these plugins. They are deeply entrenched. They have major corporate backing. And many developers are very familiar with them and enjoy working with them. They also have uh, some fast, fantastic development tools, which have provided a lot of power and ease of use over the last uh, decade or so. And these tools don't exist for these new HTML5 features yet. So um, many of the features that plugins provided developers, they gained popularity because the browsers themselves were stagnant, as I said, in the early 2000s. Um, once Internet Explorer had 90% market share, it didn't really progress much, and um, it was really hard to get progress in browsers outside of plugins. However, now that the browser vendors are back and engaged, um, expect to see that uh, browser, plugin usage as a necessity will reduce over time. Is, uh, Brian, is there any delta in, are there still some areas of functionality where plugins provide some extra capabilities that, that HTML5 doesn't? 
Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, although most of them have been addressed with HTML5, one of the ones that's a big is, for instance, webcam support is in some of these newer versions of plugins. That's proposed for later versions of HTML, but not in the current HTML5 standard. The other thing is that a lot of what plugins provide that HTML5 doesn't is a very rich third-party component set. So if that's a real goal of your application to, to, to use the Microsoft development tools and, and APIs that are provided for it, then Silverlight might be a good fit for you. Or consequently, if you know, you're know you very familiar with or need the functionality in Flash third-party development tools, um, that's something that HTML5 doesn't really live up to yet. So let's jump right in then and get a very high level picture of how HTML5 changes basic web page coding. So first off, HTML5 provides a whole bunch of new markup elements. And if you look closely in this, what you'll see is that um, the names of these tags, they're logical rather than presentational. Many of them could be considered section elements, and that's often how they're referred to. And this is in line with what the previously stated design goal that I mentioned of um, analyzing the kind of things that content developers are already trying to do with HTML today and just providing built-in elements to represent those same content areas. So you also see elements here for things like media display, audio, video, and a few new UI controls as well. Likewise, uh, there's a set of elements that have actually been frowned on in recent usage in HTML and they weren't really uh, used correctly or effectively, and many of these have been removed from the specification because there's usually better alternatives to them in style sheets. So as a quick example of what an HTML5 page looks like, I'll show you some of those HTML5 elements in action. Now, whereas previously developers would have to put generic elements into a page, such as div tags or span tags, which could be styled, um, or hand identified with uh, footer and header metadata, well, HTML5 now has introduced specific elements to represent those common use cases. For example, there's now very specific uh, content in HTML5 to mark part of a document as an article and other parts as headers, footers, and navigation. And although this is handy for developers, it's also very nice for search engines and tools. Search engines will take a look, for example, at a page and give more relevance to content which is in the article part of a page and less to content which is in a navigation or footer section. And tooling can also assist developers in creating these common page sections and allow them to be duplicated across all the pieces of a web application. I, I do want to stress something here, though, that, uh, so that no one takes away the wrong message from this slide, which is that the structure elements in HTML5 only give developers standardized places in their documents for putting their content. It doesn't imply the actual appearance of the page. That's still covered by uh, cascading style sheets. And what I'm showing here is just one example of uh, colors and forms and placements of CSS and not indicative of uh, the way an HTML5 page looks in common. Okay, so um, the core of HTML5, though, is not really about markup. It's really about a set of new JavaScript APIs. So let me take a quick high-level tour of those APIs right now. A bit of a whirlwind here, so feel free to look up uh, online resources or buy a book or something if you need to know more about a specific topic. So the first one I want us to look at uh, is HTML5 forms. Forms have been around, of course, since the very earliest versions of HTML, and they are what allowed web commerce to really blossom. Unfortunately, they haven't changed very much since the initial uh, uh, versions, and web applications today are, are stuck with the same text fields and checkboxes that they've been using since the beginning of the web. Or alternatively, developers go and they find a third-party JavaScript library uh, or try to build their own complicated form controls like date pickers using JavaScript and primitive elements. Uh, this is one of those areas that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Flash uh, uh, and Silverlight have an edge because they provide a lot of high-level widgets for developers. And this is one of the driving forces for HTML5 to play catch-up in this area. Um, HTML5 Forms was, was really developed as a separate specification at first, um, and one of the primary, dr primary drivers of that specification was to reduce the amount of JavaScript that developers need to write to achieve their goals. So let's, let's take an example of email. Okay. There are hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of web pages out there, definitely thousands at least, which ask a user to enter a valid email address. So as a developer, uh, you'd like to be able to ensure that what the user actually types or puts into the field is a well-formed email address. 
But the problem here is that the rule for checking whether uh, a piece of text is valid email is very complicated, as this regular expression shows. Now, before HTML5 forms, developers would need to either put this kind of code in themselves, or send it to the server and check it there, or use a third-party library to check to see if something was a real valid email address. And that causes extra network traffic and extra headaches. So HTML5, for example, just includes the ability to mark a particular field as being an email field, and the browser does all the rest for you for free. So you mentioned that you don't need JavaScript for doing validation. Does, does that mean there is no need for JavaScript at all in HTML5, and is JavaScript a part of HTML5? Um, you still need JavaScript. Um, let, me, let me make sure I clarify that statement. You'll still need to use JavaScript to wire up the components and to provide a little bit of description of what kinds of validation you want to have happen. So you could, for instance, write a tiny bit of JavaScript hook to say, I want to make sure all uh, values in this field are capitalized. But the hard stuff, the things that are really hard to wire up in JavaScript, those are taken care of by the browser browser, and it provides JavaScript events and hooks so that you can customize it into a fine detail rather than make you do the work for the easy tasks. So here we have um, uh, a list of uh, some of the common HTML5 form controls, and most of these controls you might actually have expected to be in HTML5 today, but they're not. If you're seeing them on the web, it's because there's a third-party JavaScript library that's providing them for you. Um, now, a good example of, of how these uh, enhance a website is the, um, the web-optimized input text fields. So if you've used a smartphone recently, for instance, you might notice that when you're entering a text into a field which is supposed to be a URL, you get a specialized keyboard that pops up with entries for things like .com to make it very easy to enter a URL. And that's a result, a direct result, of HTML5 form inputs. All a developer has to do is mark a field in a page as being a URL type. The browser notices that and can present a specialized keyboard. And so there's, this is an example of a very easy way for developers today to put some extra data in their pages and make everyone's lives easier. And the best part about it is that it's backwards compatible. If you put the type equals URL onto your text field, it still works just fine in older browsers. They just don't give the extra functionality. And, and as an example layout, I'll show something that one of my uh, co-authors, Peter Lovers, generously provided. This is a shot of uh, a bunch of HTML5 form controls being used. Um, what you'll see here, there's a field that, sh that takes focus automatically when the page loads, something that was never easy to do in HTML. There's a spin control for picking shoe sizes. There's uh, validation of required fields, uh, a date picker for birth dates, a web URL field, and um, you had to do this before, as I said, with complicated scripting libraries, and now this is being built into the browsers themselves. Now, you may note there's a note here that says that these are only supported on um, uh, Opera. Well, since this demo was originally created, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, they now support the same functionality, which is just another example of things progressing very rapidly in this space. Next set of controls we'll talk about a little bit is HTML5 audio and video. So audio and video are one area that really exploded on the web, um, primarily due to plugins. And it's somewhat surprising that browsers don't have built-in support for audio and video already today. But if you remember that browser development stagnated again in the early part of the decade when video was really taking off, that makes a little more sense. At the time, the standards bodies decided to let plugins be the, the, the vehicle for video. And there were battles between a few plugin vendors in that, in that regard, and largely Flash one out. Um, well, consistent with that idea that the browser should once again handle these uh, popular activities, the HTML5 spec added elements specifically for media. Um, there's an audio tag, a video tag, and they can show a, a variety of content types and give you a very easy to use JavaScript API for manipulating the content. And I can give you an example of this uh, that I used in the book. It took me only a few hours to uh, take a video tag and write a JavaScript program which could grab screen captures from it create a timeline that allows a user to simply click and jump to various places in a video. And this is something I never would have been able to do before with HTML alone, and now it's something you can do with HTML5 with a very short amount of Java code. However, um, the content that can be displayed in HTML5 uh, media tags is a little more complicated. And for those of you who have been following this issue, you may have noticed that there's been a publicized battle over which audio and video types, or codecs, 
should be supported natively in browsers. Now there are advocates of free codecs um, who proposed that the, the standard HTML5 should require that open source codecs be put in the specification. But there were sites that thought that the open source codecs weren't necessarily up to quality standards and didn't want to be forced to support them. And then on the other hand, you had some providers of browsers that were heavily invested in uh, patented uh, codecs, such as one known as H.264, which is used in very many devices and uh, applications today. So in the end, the HTML5 specification did not endorse or require a particular codec to be uh, put into browsers, but what it does do is allow people to say, here are alternatives to uh, the content in this media, and the browser can negotiate and decide which would appropriately fit the, the display at the, at the current time and download that particular version. Um, there was a little bit of news in the last couple months where Google shook things up by purchasing and releasing a free codec known as WebM, and uh, there's a lot of discussion around that right now to see if that could become a potential standard. So are, are, do we know how, what, what, what each of the implement, browser implementations are going to use? Uh, are, they, are, are there going to be any consistencies around the codecs that are used in Chrome, Firefox, or, or IE9, or is that still unclear? There's, it's largely coming down to those two that I mentioned. So um, there's a lot of support behind the new WebM standard from Chrome, of course, being Google and Firefox. Um, on the other hand, Microsoft and Apple with Safari are largely putting their weight behind the H.264 codec. So if you really want to make sure you hit the full set of users, you would want to put your video in both codecs, and the browser will choose automatically and download the correct one. Um, you're pretty much covered if you go with those two, and we'll see if it shakes out down to one in the future. More, more broadly, is, is this the only real distinction or, or, or difference that there may be between the implementations of HTML5? So aside from video, can developers pretty much assume that, that they'll never have to, that, that there's no difference in, in the implementations or the functionality of HTML5 from browser to browser? It's, I'm hard pressed to think of one. I mean, as I said before, the specification's got a thousand pages of detail in it, and this is the only area where there has been a significant contention, and it's largely around patentability and licensing. There have been some issues in the past regarding, you know, were there technologies in HTML5 which were infringed on patents, but those have largely been resolved, and there aren't really any open issues in that area today. It's, it's basically web video content that is still causing some issues. Okay. Um, and I do want to point out HTML5 video is actually being employed on a, a number of sites to this day, uh, the first of which is YouTube, which allows developers to, uh, sorry, which allows users to opt in and choose HTML5 delivery. It's a beta feature, but it's something you can try out right now. So the next uh, area I want to talk a little bit about is um, one of the features that I'm personally the most excited about, and that's the drawing canvas and the scalable vector graphics support, known as SVG. So Canvas and SVG are a real breakthrough on the web. Uh, I can remember when I started developing uh, web pages you know, long ago, and I really needed to create something which seemed simple, like a diagonal line just to display in a page. And I remember how difficult that was. It wasn't really possible without using hacks involving images and strange CSS rules. And so what the Canvas element and uh, scalable vector graphics bring to web pages is something that plugins like Flash and Silverlight or any other drawing toolkit really have had for a long time and developers have taken for granted and that's a rich drawing toolkit. And what's more, um, by being completely integrated into HTML5, the canvas and scalable vector graphics are very easily scripted and they can integrate with the rest of the page and the other HTML5 technologies. For example, it's easy to take an HTML5 video display and modify its pixels with overlays. Uh, it's easy to take vector graphics and animate them using CSS transition. So there are very many possibilities in this area of integration between the uh, HTML5 components. And for the record, uh, for people who need to know the differences between Canvas and SVG, um, if you've worked in graphics or animation or illustration, it's probably clear, but uh, a canvas is for fast, low-level drawing primitives such as lines, shapes, and text, which don't need user interaction. Whereas scalable vector graphics, on the other hand, it's a programmatic representation of a scene or drawing. Uh, a rectangle, for instance, uh, in a canvas is drawn and forgotten, but in SVG, it can be changed after its creation. It actually has an object that you can reference. It can be resized or recolored or reshaped or moved around. Uh, 
And this makes SVG very well suited for animations and manipulations like scaling, uh, while Canvas is better at very fast displays of, anim of uh, drawing. So Canvas then is, is like an artist palette. Uh, developers have full control over an area of the web page to draw shapes. Um, in fact, there's very compelling web drawing tools which have already been released on the internet today and they're, they're Canvas based. And it's one of the oldest HTML5 elements which has been shipping in browsers. It's, it's been around for a few years already. And it's also intriguing in that Canvas is designed to be an extensible API, which means that there are 3D versions of Canvas in the works. And I'll talk a little bit about, about those in a minute. Now, if, if you'd like to see some really good Canvas demos, I don't have time to, to break out and show them to you here, but I highly recommend that you check out a site called canvasdemos.com. Uh, it's also been around for quite a while, and there's amazing demos of what you can do with Canvas there that don't require any plugins. It's all done natively in the browser. So SVG, on the other hand, lets developers create an XML-based representation of a drawing model. So a developer can say, you know, here's where a shape should reside in a page, and when they modify that shape in any way, the browser automatically updates the visuals to match the modification. So if you think uh, charts, or graphs, or diagrams, you should be thinking SVG. And it's been around for a long time as a plugin, since around 2002 or so. And uh, as a standard has matured, it's now been incorporated into HTML5 and is supported by many browsers, including the upcoming, HTML, uh, the upcoming IE9. And as an example, the, the scalable part of scalable vector graphics um, is that you, when you scale an SVG object to a larger size, it redraws it at a high fidelity at that size rather than uh, produce something which is very pixelated. So if you need to scale images around, SVG is a very good fit for that. Uh, and just like with Canvas, there's compelling demos for SVG out there on the web today. Uh, one of the f most fun is one that came from Microsoft, uh, but you can find a lot of examples uh, related to charting and graphing around the web today. So the next uh, topic we'll take a very brief look at is what's called HTML5 Web Workers, and it's a very, very elegant solution to a long-standing web problem. The problem being that web applications today are not threaded. Uh, even though most advanced development toolkits give you threads or tasks or some capability to let operations take place in the background, JavaScript was designed with uh, the simplicity of a single-threaded environment in mind. Now, that's not alone or unique to JavaScript, uh, there, but, but it does cause complications for advanced apps which are trying to build you know, calculations and such into the behavior in the browser. So, um, as an example, if you've ever seen a warning in your browser uh, of a window that pops up saying that a script may be misbehaving or have stopped responding, this is often caused by developers trying to do too much work in the single threaded environment provided in a web page in JavaScript. So to solve this, HTML5 gives a very, very simple new API that lets a developer create what's called a worker. And these workers perform tasks which might be moved by the browser into a separate CPU or a separate thread. And those workers can send messages back and forth between the page which created them. So if you, for instance, had something where you wanted to do a query in a database or some long running calculation, you might put that into a worker and let the worker run on its own thread, its own context, and let you know when the calculation or query is done. And that's worth noting because as I mentioned earlier, um, performance uh, is vastly improved in the latest generations of browsers. And it's now very feasible to have applications which are doing these kind of complex calculations online right in the browser. That's a goal of HTML5. The next of the features I want to talk about is geolocation. And if you're using a modern smartphone, you've probably been using geo geolocation already today. Now geolocation, what it does is it gives developers a very simple way to determine the user's physical location. Um, in HTML5, you can do this with just a one or two line function call. The browser does all the real work. It determines where the user resides. It can use a combination of uh, global positioning, GPS, uh, network triangulation. There's, there's a whole lot of different techniques and companies which provide this data, and the browsers hook into that. Now, the most common case you've probably seen for geolocation is for mapping applications or to, for instance, tag photos so that after you take a photo and you come back later, it'll actually have information of the location where it was taken built right into it. Um, 
you could also have an application where you're walking around and it can tell you, hey, there's a, a great deal at a nearby store based on your current location. Now, if you're worried about privacy, and, and many people are, um, the spec for geolocation has been designed so that the browser always prompts you for permission. And this is one way you might know that you've already been using geolocation. Best example, Google Maps. There's a section in a Google Map that allows you to say, click my location, it prompts the user for permission, and then it uh, uses your location and provides you directions or location very specific to where you are. Very handy. Okay, we're, as we're wrapping up our feature discussion, let's look a little bit at web storage. Web storage is easy to think of as browser cookies on steroids for anyone who's been doing application development on the web. And it gives you pretty much exactly what you might expect. It's a way to just simply store local values for later retrieval. So storage has different scopes built into it. There's the concept of something called a session storage. And session storage values are just stored for as long as the user has that window open. Then for more persistence, you can put something into what's called local storage. And local storage will persist across a browser shutdown. So when a developer puts a piece of data into a local storage, then he or she can come back as a developer um, later and retrieve that piece of data in the next day, the next year, just as long as the user or the browser doesn't remove it. And then there's also even in, in the works a full-fledged local database API for browsers that will allow you to uh, query and store you know, lots of values and select them based on a query language. This, one, this particular feature is less progressed, but uh, it's definitely going to open up a lot of new possibilities for, for web application development. Okay, so um, cookies versus web storage. Um, as again, as I mentioned, web storage is really designed to replace browser cookies for cases where those cookies aren't optimal. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with cookies, what they do is they're a very common browser feature that's been around since the early days of HTML, and they let little bits of information travel back and forth between a web page and a server that originated it. So that can be used to store things like user preferences or information about the session, um, and there, there are security issues with cookies, but, but they do make the web a lot easier to use. However, they also use a lot of unnecessary bandwidth because you're sending that information back and forth from client to server all the time. Um, so what web storage does is for those cases where the developer really needs to store little bits of information like you know, what a user has preferred to do on this page, they can stick that directly in the browser and have it stored so that they can retrieve it later. Now. Um, as an example, you can see in this demo page, a developer can make a very simple JavaScript call and place a value into local storage, and users can look inside their browser preferences and see exactly what's being stored in that storage. And as expected, developers can only access values that they create themselves for those who are concerned about privacy. But this will uh, allow a lot of new application types, as I'll talk about in a minute with offline, and it allows less communication over the network for uh, environments like mobile where that's really important. Okay, um, a brief mention of HTML5 support for offline applications, which I, I did allude to earlier. So offline support, long been a thorn in the side of application developers. Um, many desktop applications tout this as a feature above what web applications can provide. Um, but now that offline support has been introduced into HTML5 and along with storage, it's very possible for developers to write apps which can work in a disconnected mode. And these apps can store data locally in storage, such as emails or documents, and send it back to a server once the user reconnects. Uh, similarly, HTML5 adds settings that let a uh, developer mark an application as cacheable, which means the browser can download and save its resources for use when the uh, user is offline and hasn't even loaded the full application. Finally, the final feature I'd like to talk about is called WebSockets, which has the potential to fundamentally change how apps communicate with remote servers. So the web is built on a few fundamental protocols. Um, it relies on TCP and IP throughout the internet, but the web itself is really built on the HTTP protocol, which is a request and response model. And by that I mean that when a browser makes a request, the server sends back a single response, and that's the end of it. And that's really good for document retrieval, which is what the web was originally built to do, but not really good for dynamic applications where you need a lot of data flowing back and forth from browser to servers and vice versa. So 
when we talk about simultaneous two-way communication, we refer to that as being full duplex. So when you pick up your telephone and you call someone, both callers can talk at the same time. That's full duplex. On the other hand, HTTP is a half duplex um, communication style. The browser makes a request and the server responds, but the server can't communicate with the browser at any time that it chooses. And that, in, in a nutshell, is problematic for a lot of application types that demand real-time connectivity. So for example, financial apps or games or monitoring applications that want to keep an eye on power, traffic, weather, things like that. Um, those are examples of applications where the one-way request response model of HTTP is not ideal. Now there have been a lot of hacks that web apps have been doing, successfully even for many years. Um, they're collectively referred to as Comet techniques. And that involves repeatedly asking those servers over and over again, do you have new information? Do you have something new? Do you have something new? And that's a technique which is referred to as polling. You're polling a server for new information. Uh, or you may send a message to the server and the server will wait a long time to respond until it has some data and then finally respond. But those techniques are really highly inefficient, so HTML5 has introduced a better way to do real-time two-way communication, and that is the WebSocket. The WebSocket uh, was designed by the What Working Group I talked about earlier and is now being uh, developed in the IETF, Internet Engineering Task Force. And it's a new standard that gives developers a very simple way to connect to a remote server and keep a persistent connection open. And then the server and the browser can freely communicate and send messages back and forth in an optimized fashion. So WebSocket, you know, as you might expect, is only designed to allow browsers to access servers where both parties agree that it is permissible for the uh, client to access. So servers have to opt into WebSocket. It's not something that's going to introduce something on the existing web infrastructure. But when it's in place, it vastly reduces the amount of network traffic needed to transmit data compared to HTTP or comic techniques I talked about earlier. Um, the reason is that once a WebSocket is established, all the transmission back and forth from client to server is pure data, whereas HTTP communications or polling send a lot of extra overhead to try to get some approximation of real time. And it's a vast orders of magnitude difference and how much traffic is needed to communicate with um, WebSocket versus the old Comet techniques. And a, a sort of interesting example, there was a famous demo that Google released earlier this year, which was a port of the old game Quake 2 to a browser. And a lot of people heard about this demo. It actually showed off particularly the canvas that I talked about earlier, and, and, and specifically even the 3D version of that canvas running in a browser. This is, this is a game that used to require a high-end PC, now just running as a JavaScript app in a browser. But one thing that a lot of people missed is that the way this game communicated back to its server to have players running around and communicating was with WebSockets. And that's because Google's Chrome browser has had WebSocket support for about a year now. Uh, Safari added it recently, and the new version of Firefox that's just about to be released has it as well. So one of the nice abilities, however, that WebSockets lets developers have access to is that um, by being lightweight and very similar to the TCP protocol for the internet, uh, this means that it's possible to layer additional data types and additional protocol types on top of WebSocket. So it's very easy to put video or remote desktop display or other standard industry protocols for messaging and chat, build those on top of WebSocket. And an architecture which might support that model shown in this slide here. If you look at this example, what you'll see is that there's a whole series of web devices uh, with HTML5 browsers on the left. And what they can do is they can contact a WebSocket aware server using the built-in networking capabilities that HTML5 gives them. And then in turn, that server can proxy the communication on to existing servers that have uh, data and features that are needed in real time. The server can strip off the WebSocketness of them, essentially, so that those remote servers that aren't expecting WebSocket can participate today in working real time with web clients. It's a very powerful model for internet, sorry, excuse me, interconnectivity. Uh, and it, it exists today in the internet, but not really in the web before the advent of something like WebSockets. So you should ask yourself this question then, if web applications are not stuck with HTTP, what types of web applications could we build? And the answer is um, many fold. Uh, I listed some here. But you can imagine uh, lots more portfolio trading, real-time news, traffic and weather, power monitoring, video conferencing, 
These are things that are on the web today, but they often require plugins or they aren't in real time. Uh, for instance, you think of a popular auction site, uh, how it could be served by having real-time data flowing back and forth from client to server, getting real-time updates on what the latest bids or news were for the uh, auction you're participating in. Or these sites are available, but they don't work very well with proxies and firewalls. And these are the kind of things that WebSocket really helps with today. So the final section I want to give here is a little bit of tips on how you might go forward with website uh, and application development with HTML5. So the first thing you need to know is that HTML5 applications are built the same way that HTML4 applications are built today. They're largely a combination of HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and in some cases you might want to provide one of those offline caching manifests which allow you to develop when you're not connected to the internet. Now one of the weaknesses of HTML5 is that it has very few tools today which isn't really surprising due to the newness of the spec, but uh, tools are being developed very rapidly and we can expect this will be an area of growth in the near future. In the absence of vendor tools, however, um, it's important to note that the browsers themselves are actually shipping fairly complex development and debugging and even performance tools in the browser themselves. And um, they also allow you to easily detect features which may or may not be supported in a current browser and work around it. A couple of uh, libraries that will assist in this as well. Um, there's one that's very popular called Modernizer. And um, as opposed to the way that people used to develop applications where they would uh, sniff and see, you know, is this a Netscape browser, then do this, or is this Internet Explorer, and do that. These new libraries allow you to say, does this browser support geolocation? If so, use it. If not, do something else. Um, it's a shift in how developers can build future-proof applications and it also means that as new versions of browsers come out that are adding these new HTML5 features, you'll pick them up automatically. So I'd highly recommend looking at Modernizer or uh, another one here known as HTML5 Shiv, which lets developers put emulations of some of these new technologies into browsers like Internet Explorer by using the extension capabilities IE already supports. Other ways to emulate HTML5 features that may not be available in a browser of choice, such as a, a, you know, Internet Explorer, Google Gears, a plugin, uh, Flash itself can actually be used to emulate some of these HTML5 uh, environments and give you a consistent developer experience. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a lot of uh, work that's being done right now um, to essentially get Internet Explorer up to par so that there's a consistent way to access functionality no matter what your platform is if you're going to be deploying to the web at large. And I've listed a few of those resources here, but they're evolving every day and improving things greatly. So what's next? Um, there's actually a lot of very recent excitement going on in the HTML community. A lot of that is ironically uh, around Microsoft. Microsoft made a very large turnaround uh, from where they were in the 2000s. Uh, they had gone to about to 95% browser market share uh, 10 years ago, but they were largely inattentive to the browser over the course of the last few years, and there have been a lot of competitors coming along, and now Microsoft's uh, market share for browsers has sunk to closing in on 50%. Now, that, the good news, though, is that um, Microsoft's been very active in HTML5 with its newest browser, which is IE9, which went into beta, I think, about a week ago. They're very, very serious. They put a lot of resources into it, and they're speaking very publicly about their uh, desire to support and improve their uh, implementations of HTML5. Now, as Microsoft does continue to deprecate its older operating systems and ship new ones that require the most recent browsers, I think you'll see a very rapid adoption of HTML5 support in the internet at large. Are there any fully compatible HTML5 browsers right now? I would say it's not really fair to define that, only because the specification itself won't lock down to 2012. However, um, the WebKit-based browsers, and that's largely Chrome and Safari, are very, very close to full feature support. Uh, there's a few little odds and ends which are uh, still not covered, but they're sort of the edge cases of advanced form validation or advanced video uh, operations and, uh, and uh, dynamic behaviors that aren't covered quite well yet, but the, uh, the actual evolution of them is, is very rapid, and what I'm saying here may not apply in six months. <laughs>
What about Firefox? Firefox is catching up. It actually fell a little behind the curve. However, the new version that's coming out, this uh, Firefox version 4, which I think is in beta 6 at this point and coming out in November, really plays a good game of catch up with uh, Chrome and Safari. And Firefox's performance improved vastly. It added support for things like WebSocket, like I mentioned. And uh, it's definitely in the game and very, very close with uh, the WebKit-based browser. So what, what, in what time frame could someone write an HTML5 app and expect it to be able to run on most of the major web browsers? Good question, very good question. And so I think that depends on which of the HTML5 features you focus on. If you s limit yourself to the subset which are going to be supported in IE9, that includes a lot of things like Canvas and SVG and audio video, you can build something for that target platform, and when IE9 comes out, it will rapidly grab a lot of market share from older versions of IE. And at that point, you'd, you'd hit safely about 75% of the market and increasing. So if that's a reasonable way for you to go, 75% um, or so, then probably within the next six months or so, once IE9 is shipped, if you're, using, if, if you're able to target to a corporate environment where you can control who's accessing from which browsers, and you don't necessarily need everything to work in IE, then, of course, you can do that kind of uh, support today. I noticed you didn't mention web sockets or offline storage. For IE? No, um, there's still a few things missing there. Uh, geolocation is another one that's actually very popular and used in a lot of phones, but uh, IE isn't is supporting it right now. They're a little bit uh, uh, tight-lipped about what they will end up supporting. In fact, we didn't know that they were going to support Canvas until just a month or two ago, and everybody was really clamoring for them to do it. And sure enough, they did it, and in a very big way, with uh, lots of uh, video card uh, hardware optimization. So we never really know if they're going to have WebSockets and geolocation and storage, and, uh, well, they have storage, but geolocation and WebSockets uh, support. We may be surprised before it goes final form. All right. Um, and again, the HTML5 spec, it's not stopping at HTML5 in 2012. There are other devices, uh, sorry, there are other elements for things like video conferencing that are in the works, and it's yet to be determined how they'll be released, but you can expect that the uh, standard will continue to evolve. So that's my presentation today. If we have a little bit of time, we can uh, answer a few more questions. I also have a couple resources I can point you to if you'd like to find out more about what's supported in uh, any particular browser. Well, we do have a, a few questions. We have a, quite a few questions, actually. We'll try to get through a couple of them here, and some of sure. them will answer offline. Um, so uh, one person was wanting to go back to the issue about plugins, and, and, they're just, and they were trying to clarify if Silverlight and Flash are going to become obsolete. I think that's, a, that's too strong of a word to say right now. There, there will always be a place for people who are developing Silverlight or Flash-based applications. And some of that has to do with the fact that if your corporate environment is very Microsoft-focused, what something like Silverlight lets you do is take all of your development experience, APIs, and tools and bring it to the web. Now, that being said, uh, in terms of general internet deployment, HTML5 is rapidly catching up to the functionality that was Pri uh, primarily it force you to use a plugin for. So I think you'll see a lessening of importance for them on the web at large, but not necessarily inside of corporate environments. Well, I also think that, that there's a lot of big unknowns, and, and one is that nothing ever stands still, and, and who knows what extra things the plugin vendors might try to do to, make, to keep themselves vital. That, and then it's a question of whether some of the app develop, or web developers feel that those are compelling enough to continue using them. Absolutely. The plugins aren't going to stand still, and, and they have the advantage as well of being able to evolve very rapidly because they don't go through the standardization process. So you'll, you'll definitely continue to see a lot of interesting things and developments coming out of Adobe and Microsoft's work. Another question is around cross-HTML or cross-browser and cross-domain issues. Are we going to still see those with HTML5? Well, um, you know, I'd like to say uh, uh, that that would all go away uh, and, and, and work magically well, but um, I think what, when instead there will always be bugs, there will always be problems that um, browsers, you know, have issues with in terms of security. But in terms of things like cross-origin communication, there is, I, I didn't talk about it in this particular presentation, but there's very specific standards that are being built around allowing cross-origin communication to happen in a safe way where both the browser and the server buy in. And that's something that has been hacked around a lot, but is now part of the standardization process. And, and that's an example even of one that Internet Explorer 8 uh, 
has implemented as well as the rest of the browsers. So there's definitely a lot of improvements in cross-browser communication, cross-origin communication. Well, thanks so much, Brian, for talking with us today. And uh, we've come to the end of our time. <laughs> and uh, we're going to make this available to all of our listeners online. And we'll, I'll, I'll announce it to the group, uh, to the Software Engineering Productivity Forum when we have the publication up or when we publish the, the webinar. And I will we'll also be uh, posting along with that answers to all the questions that we didn't get to today. Excellent. I appreciate the invite. It's been a pleasure.